Kia ora, good evening, I'm Dave Gooselink. Protesters took their voices to the doorstep of the Gore District Council this week, raising concerns over the reappointment of outgoing CEO Stephen Parry. The group have started a petition to seek his immediate removal as the future of the position hangs in the balance. The wet weather wasn't stopping these protesters from voicing their message outside the Gore District Council this week. More than a dozen residents gathered outside the council building on Monday. Their protest was against the council's plans to reappoint departing CEO Stephen Perry as its interim chief executive after failing to find a suitable replacement candidate. The Gore District Citizen Action Group staged their protest just half an hour before a council meeting where councillors were due to discuss the role. They would rather Mr Perry wasn't in the picture. Past behaviour and clashes with the public, I would say. Perry previously resigned as Gore Council CEO in September and had been due to finish up at the end of this month. Protester Jack McIntyre was able to meet with Acting Mayor Keith Hovell to discuss the group's concerns, but was left disappointed to learn that Perry would likely be appointed anyway. They never get an answer out of the council in regard to anything like this. That's as simple and basic as I can make it. The action group says they'll continue seeking support and signatures for their paper-based petition, which they plan to present to council at the end of the month. In Gore, the South today. It's more than four years since 51 people were killed in the Christchurch mosque shootings. Now six weeks of public hearings are underway with family and friends of victims hoping it may shed light on some unanswered questions. These family members and friends of victims killed in the 2019 mosque terror attacks, looking for answers. A six-week coronial inquest into the murder of 51 people began on Tuesday morning. It's looking to answer some of the questions that remain about the violent attacks on worshippers at the al Noor Mosque and Linwood Islamic Centre in March 2019. More than 600 people, families of victims, survivors and witnesses are expected to attend over day one of the hearing. A further 100 registered to watch the hearing online. Muslim community leaders are hoping the long-awaited coronial inquest may finally put to rest some unanswered questions. The first phase of the inquest is set to focus around 10 key issues, including the initial emergency response and whether anyone could have been saved with faster medical treatment. Other aspects being investigated during the hearing are the steps taken to apprehend the offender. It'll also examine whether the offender had direct assistance from anyone else and whether the emergency exit door in Al Noor Mosque's main prayer room failed to function during the mass shooting. The terrorist Brenton Tarrant was sentenced to life in prison without parole in 2020. He pled guilty to 51 counts of murder, 40 of attempted murder and one of engaging in a terrorist act. Family members of the victims are hoping that the full truth from that fateful day may finally help them find closure. In Christchurch, the South today. A brave Central Otago teenager won't be having a bad hair day this month after shaving off his locks for a good cause. Octavia Neal has been exercising some charitable spirit, raising money for two causes close to his heart. Saying goodbye to his luscious locks and saying hello to a fresh new summer look. 13-year-old Cromwell College student Octavia Neal taking a practical step for a good cause. Shaving his head this week in Alexandra. The teenager's had his fair share of health challenges and was keen to give back to the Christchurch Hospital's Child Hematology and Oncology Centre and the Paediatrics Ward at Dunedin Hospital. Because they both helped me out in my life when I was 10 months old, had cancer and my new condition called CIDP. Since I was 11, I've had CIDP. Octavia's aiming to raise $1,500 for the two hospital centres. And he wasn't the only one going under the shaver at the Kahu Youth Trust building. Mother Vicky joining him and also sacrificing her long locks for charity. Last night he was very anxious about doing it, hence is why I decided to do it at the last minute as well, knowing how anxious he was and because he had grown it for so long and he was nervous, so it was like to support him, I was like, it's here, it grows back. <laughs> Octavia says he's grateful for the support of his mum and dad for the challenge, but is happy to be able to give back to those who've helped him. In Alexandra, the South Today. 
An ocean-going catamaran that was almost sunk in a recent storm has left Queenstown for the final time. The old wooden boat named the Ruwaka has been tied up and unused for years, but will soon be setting sail for the Pacific Ocean. The stray cat taking its final voyage across Lake Wakatipu. The Ruawaka catamaran travelling to Kingston before being taken to the ocean. The 20 metre long Polynesian twin hull boat was built by Queenstown's Stu Rolf, but had it moved from its mooring spot just off Frankton Road in over two decades. The large boat was recently bought by Swiss based enthusiast Fred Altenbrook. He plans to dismantle the boat and transport it to Port Chalmers, where it'll be repaired ahead of its next trip across the Pacific Ocean. We would live aboard and then uh, charter, take some people to the, into the yeah, Pacific Islands and uh, yeah, live, live uh, another lifestyle than we have now. Ironically, the Ruawaka broke free of its mooring of 20 years in Frankton Arm just two weeks ago due to wind gusts in a recent storm. The unmanned vessel sailed without a captain into the middle of Lake Wakatipu before being rescued by the Queenstown Coast Guard and Harbour Master who left the vessel beached at Kelvin Grove. It's coming off the mooring. I was like, what the hell? So it was just a yeah, big surprise. I was uh, panicked and I was like, it's going to wreck in the rocks somewhere. And uh, yeah, luckily the Coast Guards were here. Uh, Alton Brooks says once the 10 person boat is repaired and seaworthy again, he wants to take his wife and kids across the Pacific on a family trip. After that, he plans to charter the Royal Walker out to other ocean sailors. In Queenstown, the South Today. FI Akine, still to come on Southern Newsweek. A female dairy farmer from North Otago is $10,000 richer after winning a new rural competition. And success for Southern Sausages, as butcheries celebrate winning big at a delicious competition. Welcome back. A Dunedin High School was draped in international colours last week as it celebrated the wide range of cultural diversity among its students. King's High School's annual cultural festival brought different parts of the world together in their Dunedin school grounds. Watching a karate demonstration between two black belts or lining up for some delicious Syrian flatbread. There was a strong international flavour at Dunedin's King's High School on Thursday at its annual cultural festival. Around 50 countries were being represented at the school grounds, with students making use of the extended lunch hour to experience something unique. The world has over 3,800 diversely rich cultures and to understand each other's cultures that is incredibly different from our own is incredibly important. Head boy Massimo Pizzuto grew up with an Italian father and Maori mother and says he understands the importance of celebrating cultural diversity. What started out as a small uh, idea between three students grew into a cultural festival that we hope will continue for years to come at our school. He was excited to see the range of cultures being showcased and says seeing other boys enjoy the festivities made the afternoon occasion worthwhile. In Dunedin, the South Today. Some of Central Otago's most environmentally conscious children have put their heads together, sharing their ideas for the future. Dozens of school pupils from across the region took part recently in a day of green activities as they grow into sustainable young residents. Getting their hands dirty in the garden and digging deep for a better future. 65 pupils from 10 schools across central Otago put on their thinking hats this week as part of an Enviro Schools workshop at Omako School. The initiative supported by the Central Otago District Council with the aim of encouraging Tamariki to get involved in their community. It's great because Enviro Schools programme really creates some young people who are thinking sustainably for the future. So the fact we've got our young residents of Central Otago District thinking sustainably, we can only get greater things for the environment and for the people of the, the district for the future. The Hui also celebrated 21 years of the Enviro Schools program across Otago and 15 years of work in Central Otago. The young Enviro warriors tried their hands at map making, propagation and pest identification over the day 
as part of their living landscapes theme. They really like coming together and seeing each other and the teachers and principals who come really love it too because it gives them a chance to share their ideas and get to know more people around the area. Regional facilitator Lucy Frank is hoping the students will take on board the environmental ideas and pass on their knowledge to others in the community. In Omako, the South Today. Well, one North Otago dairy farmer is $10,000 richer after being named as the first Otago Daily Times Rural Life Year of the Farmer winner. Mifanway Alexander's hard work on the farm has paid off demonstrating resilience in the dairy industry while juggling bringing up two daughters. Working in the cow sheds, just another day at the office for Mifamwe Alexander. She's the winner of the 2023 Otago Daily Times Rural Life Year of the Farmer initiative, which aimed to celebrate some of the South Island's food and fibre producing champions. Alexander was one of five finalists from across Otago and Southland and chosen as the overall winner by a panel of five judges. The honour and prize pack valued at $10,000 coming as a shock. Oh my gosh, are you serious? Oh wow, holy heck, really? The Welsh-born contract milker works on a thousand cow farm near Duntroon in North Otago, where she lives with her two teenage daughters. She also leads a number of rural organisations. Her nominator describing Alexander as the embodiment of what the farming industry should be. I actually don't really have words. This is a momentous occasion, I don't have words. <laughs> Wow, thank you guys so, so much. I'm blown away. The other entrants were doing far more than I was, but I'm really appreciative of the acknowledgement. The inaugural awards has proven popular across the rural community and will be back for its second year in 2024 in Duntroon, the South today. Dunedin and Christchurch butcheries have proved they're a cut above the rest, taking out awards for their top sausages. The Great New Zealand Sausage Competition captured the attention of many meat lovers across the country, with the promotion aimed at celebrating the iconic Kiwi snag. Creating Aotearoa's best snag is just another day at the office for these hard-working butchers. More than a hundred outlets across the country have been working to craft the perfect sausage for the Great New Zealand Sausage Competition. Dunedin's Princess Street Butchery claimed a gold elite medal for their traditional pork sausage and also won bronze for their Spanish chorizo. Definitely unexpected. Like, um, yeah. I the one we won last year, I was pretty stoked on, and to go back and you know not just get a goal but get a gold elite, I was yeah over the moon. Owner David Gibson says a lot of work goes into making their sausages, and says the win's a huge achievement for the whole team. 100% proud, like very very proud. Um, couldn't ask for more. We've got a great team here, and it's good that everyone gets to celebrate success. The butchery team at Christchurch's Fresh Choice Leiston are also celebrating an elite award win. Their Memphis Ring of Fire pork sausage contains paprika and honey. Supermarket owner David Craig believes the secret to good food is keeping it simple. It's rural, you know. It's a um, it's Kiwi New Zealand still here, so we're not too uh, we're not too inspired by um, all the foreign fusion cooking and all that fancy stuff. We're down to earth, grassroots, you know, New Zealand. But the butchers aren't putting down the knives. Both stores are already brainstorming creative new <laughs> sausage flavours for next year's national competition. Across the South, the South Today. People travelling through central Otago may do a double take as they approach Clyde with a giant bird of prey now guarding the entry of the town. The giant falcons made out of recycled steel, a project that's been in the works for 10 years. A bird of prey in flight immortalised in recycled steel. The entrance to Clyde has a new guardian as a giant five metre tall statue of a native New Zealand falcon was unveiled on Saturday. The Kārere sculpture was created by Glenorchy-based artist Dan Kelly, who spent three months making the piece out of old fence posts from Central Otago Farms. It's an example of one of our beautiful native birds that we love and respect. Um, I do our native birds as a main subject. 
Naitahu and Mana Whenua representatives performed a karakia at the unveiling event, blessing the metal bird of prey in front of more than 150 onlookers. Community group Historic Clyde fundraised $74,000 for the project over the past three years, the idea taking a decade to come to fruition. I'm so proud to be part of a really neat team that um, we all had our input and yes, I was probably a bit of a pest at times. <laughs> Historic Clyde Carrere project manager Marnie Kelly says seeing the sculpture unveiled was a special moment as the community group looks towards their next project in the pipeline. In Clyde, the South Today. If I Akine is still to come on Southern Newsweek, a few Southern heroes row to save Kiwi lives as part of a national campaign for charity, and age is no barrier in another water race as competitors also raise money for a good cause. Welcome back. Well, the sunny weather earlier in the week was attracting more than just locals, with a group of Australians also taking advantage of the Dunna Stunner. More than 20 croquet players have crossed the Tasman. They're touring around the South Island for the first time in eight years. A sunny spring day on the lawn, perfect conditions for some accurate croquet strikes. 22 Australian croquet players have made their way across the ditch, looking to take the mallet to the grass on New Zealand turf. They're travelling the country as part of the Go See Touring Group, with players as old as 92 showing off their skills at Dunedin's Tainui Croquet Club on Wednesday. A lot of them are competitive, they play competitive croquet, um, some of them play nationally, some of them play internationally, um, some of them just do it for the fun of it. It's the first time the group had toured New Zealand since the COVID pandemic. The team's starting their trip with games at Christchurch's United Croquet Club. So they come from all different parts of um, Australia. So we've got some from Brisbane, some from New South Wales, we've even got some from North, um, Tasmania. The Aussie sportsmen are travelling on to Tiano and Queenstown for their next matches and are also planning some sightseeing in Milford Sound on their days off. In Dunedin, the South today. <laughs> Well, Central Otago may be known for its long bike trails, but some southern locals also decided to tackle a long journey on the water instead. Hardy kayakers and rowers travelled across Lake Dunstan over the long weekend as part of a charitable campaign which one man holds close to his heart. Bagpipes ringing over the lake, greeting tired crews after a long journey. Lake Dunstan was littered with kayakers and rowers on Sunday morning, raising money for the National Row for Life campaign. The initiative supports four charities, including the Lions Melanoma Skin Check Bus, a cause close to Clyden District's Lion Club member, James White. I had, a, had a, my nanny here last, about three months ago. That's, that's, that's where I've... My arms are good, until, but that piece is still not. White has had an ongoing battle with skin cancer and kayaked from Cromwell to the Clyde Dam alongside his daughter and two grandsons to raise awareness of the importance of getting skin checks. The family were supported by Invercargill Rowing Club and Oriti Surf Lifesaving Crews. The event, the first real fundraiser for the Rowing for Life Aotearoa campaign. Yeah, it's proved really exciting and rewarding. Um, especially having the surf lifesaving up here from, from the surf down in Invercargill to the, the quiet waters of uh, Clyde. The initiative also raises funds for the Child Cancer Foundation, Starship Hospital and Surf Lifesaving New Zealand. Row for Life is set to take to the water at Stewart Island in December, finishing up at Cape Reinga next July. In Clyde, the South Today. And choppy waves and grey skies weren't enough to deter swimmers from braving the cold last weekend for an iconic Dunedin competition. The White Island race saw surf lifeguards digging deep for a gruelling challenge, one competitor hitting the waves for his 50th race. And they're off, paddling against the surf for a big competition. 
Dunedin St. Clair Beach turned into a racetrack on Saturday as dozens of competitors took to the water for the 2023 White Island Race. The five-kilometre event had athletes racing from the beach around White Island and back with 71-year-old Graham Newton competing in the waves for his 50th time. Oh, no different than any other year, but the surf today is a bit more user-friendly than it has been for the last couple of days, so we hope it's going to be all good. It's the annual event's 54th year running, showcasing three categories, swimming, boards and boats. Competitive open water swimmer Ruby Heath says she got to know the local conditions pretty well, coming first in the swimming race. Oh, you, you can't kind of get anything better than this. Um, New Zealand's pretty special for its, its surf and its, its surf culture, so um, to be a part of it's quite special. Newton says good local knowledge and paddle techniques were the secret to success in the race, proving that age is just a number. In Dunedin, the South Today. Eastern Southland took a step back in time over the long weekend with a parade of vintage cars taking to the streets. Vauxhall vehicle owners held their national rally in Gore, celebrating a slice of New Zealand automotive history. Looking like they're rolling straight out of the 1920s. 64 Vauxhall car enthusiasts gathered in Gore over the long Labour weekend for the 40th annual National Rally. 36 classic cars were on display at the Croydon Aviation Heritage Centre at Mandeville, including Vauxhall models from as early as 1924 through to as late as 1978. Well, everybody enjoys them. We go on car runs, monthly runs, stuff like that. We meet people and become lifetime friends, make lifetime friends, whether it's New Zealand, Australia or around the world. Graham Saxton is president of the Otago Vauxhall Owners Club. He says the cars were very popular back in the day before being discontinued here in the 1980s. Yes, they stopped making that for us in New Zealand about 50 to 60 years ago now. So we struggle for parts, but we keep in touch with other clubs and we help each other out with parts, etc. So no, it's good. The annual rally alternates between the North and South Island, enthusiasts enjoying the chance to catch up with friends and others with like minds. In Gore, the South today. And that wraps up this edition of Southern Newsweek. For the latest news and videos from the Southern region, head online to odt.co.nz. You can follow Channel 39 on YouTube and the South Today NZ on Facebook to catch our news bulletins on demand. We'll see you again next week. Matewa. Public Interest Journalism, funded through New Zealand On Air.